Here we go then. I've got a bit of a different something for you today because I'm here with a really special guest. I've known this person's work since about 2012 when he did something on learning styles, which really made me think, I think made a lot of us think about the myth that that, that, that is. And he said it in such a, an articulate and well-researched way that I was, I was really impressed. He's got a great blog, which you should definitely have a look at if you haven't. And he describes himself on his Twitter handle as a sceptic and a gustatory learner. He is, of course, Russ Main. Russ, nice to see you. Nice to see you, Joe. I, uh, I wanted to have you on today because you've just written a fantastic paper about uh, the audiolingual method and why we may have misrepresented it. So that's what I really want to talk to you about. But I guess some of my, my watchers, listeners, won't, have, won't know of your work. So I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about you to start with. Okay, sure. But thanks for inviting me on. So I'm uh, principally now an EAP teacher, English for Academic Purposes. I've been teaching for about 20, what is it now, 23 years, I guess, in Asia, so China, Taiwan. I guess I did my master's in 2007 and I started to get interested in research and um, I was generally interested in scepticism and I thought what would it be like if you applied scepticism to English language teaching and I started a blog in 2012 and I've kind of been doing that ever since and yeah my principal interest is just kind of looking into things that are accepted truths or accepted wisdom and saying well you know, is it true? Do, do we know that it's true? And just kind of poking around, really. Great, fantastic. So, so tell us a bit about this this paper that you've just published. What what led you in that direction to start with? So, I have a kind of fascination with Noam Chomsky and all things Chomsky. A bit of an obsession. I, f I find his theory, the UG theory, kind of kind of somewhat incomprehensible and. Um, I was reading around and the famous Chomsky Skinner debate, which is always referenced when you when you talk about the history of English language teaching. We used to do audiolingualism, then Chomsky came along and defeated Skinner. And uh, then we moved into this brave new world of communicative language teaching. And I accepted it. Uh, I even taught it on my CELTA courses uh, when I was teaching and MA courses. And then uh, I started wondering about what actually happened and because and, I, I realized I didn't actually know what Skinner stood for, what he believed in, what Chomsky said about him. And you start reading into these things and you start finding more and more papers. And I think it led to a blog post in 2014, which is called The Myth of Neat Histories, which was one of my most popular blog posts. And it talks about some of the issues with that particular history. Uh, for example, Skinner, Skinner completely rejected Chomsky's criticism of his work. He didn't think that Chomsky really understood his work. And also Skinner had a principle or a policy of not responding to critics' work, so he never did it. So there's a kind of notion that Chomsky defeated him. Most people who say that Chomsky defeated Skinner haven't read, <laughs> yeah, they haven't read uh, Chomsky's review of Skinner's work, and they ha certainly haven't read a verbal behaviour. I don't think there are many people who've read verbal yeah. behaviour. It's not a very easy book to read. Don't, um, don't, don't you think that that's often the problem, though, that we, we end yes. up with secondary sources and yeah. you know, these things get perpetuated? It's a really big problem. It, it's a completely understandable problem because no one's got time to read all of the primary sources. What I did for this paper is I tried to read all of the primary sources. And it took about eight years to write <laughs> the paper. <laughs> so, um, if you had an infinite amount of time. But, but I, I do think it raises an issue, which I mentioned in the paper, I think. If secondary sources get it wrong, uh, particularly, I think, one of the authors that I flag up is Richardson, Richardson Rogers, their Guide to Methods book, which I, I think is quite a popular one. Uh, if there's mistakes in, in that book, then a lot of, MA students, a lot of professional academics, uh, a lot of CELTA students, they're going to accept what's written in that book as authoritative. Yeah. They're not going to go and dig out the 1945 papers and, and things like that and read them. And Absolutely. I don't blame them. 
Interesting. Well, it's great that that you actually did did the research for us, frankly, and packaged it up neatly. So, so that's uh, I think I genuinely think that that's a real service and uh, and something that you know, that's why I wanted you to talk about it because I, I think it should reach a, a wide audience. Okay, so tell us then, what did you find? What's the paper about, and what did you find? So basically, there are a number of kind of tropes. I suppose the word is that. When people talk about audiolingualism, they kind of they kind of repeat these, such as um, it was inspired by the army method. It was all about um, kind of mindless drilling. Uh, people were treated a bit like lab rats, and they were behavioralist and, and Skinner's behavioralist, and so on and so forth. And I just basically examined each of these kind of ideas or each of these parts of the of the myth of audiolingualism and see kind of what the historical record says about, about those. It's actually very difficult. I found like initially when I started, it's very difficult to research because it's not clear always what people are talking about. So they'll say, oh, audio lingualism, which was inspired by this author or that author. But if you go back into the historical documents, the first thing you'll find is that there was no method at that time ever called audio lingualism. That seems yeah. so bizarre, doesn't it? I mean, that, that was the one thing, the first thing I read in your paper, I was like, really? <laughs> it's just yeah. so bizarre. It, initially, initially at least, it did kind of get nicknamed that late. I think, I mean, the paper actually doesn't talk about what audiolingualism is. Um, there wasn't enough space, and it would have been a whole paper in itself. But it does kind of talk about those particular tenants. Like, for example, if we take one, um, the notion that audiolingualism was inspired by Skinner's verbal behaviour and behavioralism. This was a really big um, flaw uh, in a lot of what people say about <clears throat> audiolingualism. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that, um, firstly, a, lo a lot of the accounts will say that audiolingualism started in the 1940s or the 1950s, and Skinner wrote verbal behaviour in 1957. <laughs> so it can't possibly have been something that inspired those approaches. Now, people like Scott Thornbury have said, maybe the, the psychology was tacked on later. And I think that's true. But if that's the case, then you can't say it was inspired by Skinner. So why mention Skinner at all? Uh, and my feeling is that Skinner is a kind of controversial figure. He was uh, the most famous psychologist in the world at one point in the kind of modernist period, and you've got an image of him in black and white with his glasses on, looking very evil, keeping his daughter in a, in a box. I don't know if you've heard about his, the, the, the child. Okay, so one of the legends that grew up around Skinner was that he kept his uh, daughter in, in a box <clears throat> when she was a baby. <clears throat> what actually happened was he developed an air crib, <clears throat> which was a, a, a kind of glass crib, which had a, temperature regulator oh. and he thought that uh, and having become a parent recently I can kind of see the wisdom of it but the the temperature of the crib could be regulated with this and so the baby um wouldn't need to wear extra clothes if it was cold yeah. they could just wear like a nappy mm -hmm. and they would less less chance of them kind of getting tangled up in their clothes mm -hmm. um, but this was translated in the media into <laughs> Yeah. Um, Skinner had a baby in a box um, <laughs> and his daughter killed herself because she you know had such psychological problems and uh -huh. there was a chat there was a chat show he appeared on and Skinner kind of said like well I was having lunch with her yesterday so that's surprising <laughs> news to me um, you know he, he, there's an image of him being as like a kind of fascist or a Nazi or a kind of mm -hmm. Mengele type character and he if you watch videos of him which you can watch on YouTube mm -hmm. he's a kind of a lovely old guy um <laughs> he seems you know very normal but I mean the the general kind of narrative I try and paint in the picture in the in the article is that there's a very negative representation of audio lingualism and it's kind of based on army methods it's based on like a Skinnerian uh, kind of fascistic uh, stimulus response. People are treated like animals, and, mm, the whole and that's kind of the general thing. Mindless, the whole mindless drilling. drilling thing, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, parroting um, things back, and the students are kind of automatons. Oh, oh, oh. Mm. Now, 
I'm pretty sure that some of the methods that fall under the audiolingual uh, umbrella, particularly later uh, in the in the in the 60s and 70s, could have been like that. I'm pretty sure that um, there were probably classroom variations which were inspired on those principles, which probably did become like that because I've heard teachers talk about it. But um, yeah, a lot of the kind of a lot of the things that are said about audiolingualism and some of the people who are uh, associated with it um, are definitely not true, or at least are confused or um, muddled up in some in some way or another. Yeah. Yeah. I think as well, isn't that whole thing about the it being an army approach as well has right. you know, gives a particular flavour to the thing. Um, it's and, very interesting, yeah. 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 And, um, um, I think a lot of people would just associate it with drilling and being that being the kind of the, the main methodology, I suppose. Yeah, Earl, St- Earl Stevick has a brilliant quote where he actually, um, which was, I mean, brilliant for my paper, which is where he actually says something like, audiolingualism was based on drilling and conformity Mm-hmm. and the the army method and, and that's what armies like drilling and conformity or, or something like that mm-hmm. and of course the army i mean it's so obvious when someone tells you but the army method wasn't developed by the army because the army wouldn't ever develop a educational method i mean how would they do that mm-hmm. they have no educational kind of or at least at the time they have no uh, you know, if they want to do something like that, they need to outsource it to people who are uh, experts in the field. And so they actually contacted um, university professors mm-hmm. and they got the leading uh, university professors, people like uh, Leonard, Leonard Bloomfield. It's a little bit difficult to pin this down, but people like Leonard Bloomfield were the inspiration for the army method. And the army method, it's called the army method because the army used it. Mm-hmm. But it was actually the uh, the method of linguistic. linguistic anthropologists who live with tribal people and kind of learn those languages. Right. Uh, it was kind of the structuralist uh, approach, and so it kind of became associated with the army. But the army didn't really um, like it very much. That's another thing. The, I don't think it, I don't know if I included this in the paper, but the army no, got rid of the, the army got rid of it very quickly. It didn't last for longer than kind of eighteen months. Oh, okay. They scrapped it, and they they didn't think it was very useful. Um, but it got picked up in the press, and uh, it got reported as being a kind of miracle method for learning foreign languages. And the funny thing about miracle methods for learning foreign languages, if you're a language teacher, is you know these these students did huge numbers of hours, like it was like a full time job. Mm-hmm. Um, and they had to live in dorms with each other where they only spoke the language. And so for us, there's nothing miraculous about <laughs> massive amounts of input and practice leading to improvements. But for the general public, it, it did seem kind of miraculous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. OK, that's interesting. So I guess, I mean, I, I suppose the thing also to to bring up is that you are debunking the myths the negative myths that are around this and so it would be very easy I think for someone to kind of go oh Russ Mains is promoting audiolingualism and wants us all to go back to that I'm assuming that's that's not what you're saying no no um actually I know that's not what you're saying because you say it at the end of your paper (laughs) yes yeah yeah no it's an interesting question because yeah, I say, I say in the paper that uh, I'm not arguing for a return to audiolingualism. And, and there has been, uh, I think it was the Pennsylvania study, I could be wrong, a big study of audiolingualism um, where it's compared to another method. And the results were interesting because I, I'm not sure what the other method was. I can't remember, but I think the audiolingual students in the first year of the study did better in speaking and listening than the control group. But by the second year, they had kind of equaled out. 
and the other group did better in reading and writing. Now, this is really not surprising to me because um, after reading lots of research, one of the underlying things which comes out, which seems very obvious when you say it, is that the more you do a certain skill, the better you get at it. Yeah. Um, it. It may sound obvious, but you'd be surprised at the kind of, you know, round the houses method that it takes for us professionals to kind of get there. Um, various different approaches and de various different methods. But yeah, um, it seems like the audiolingual students did slightly better in speaking and listening because they did more speaking and listening. I think there's probably, like every method, things that could be learned from it. But I guess I take issue with the kind of total denigration of the method and the way it's treated in history books as being like, a, I don't know, almost like when we used um, bloodletting or something, you know, <laughs> it was kind of like some crazy uh, backward method. I mean, I don't think it was entirely a crazy method. I don't think it was, I, I, the people there were very well intentioned. And I don't think communicative approach is as uh, necessarily as um, without flaw as some people perhaps might like to, present it as being so I think that both of those things should be considered um and, and there are things we can learn from audio linguism mm. yeah no no I agree I, I mean I think you know sort of think about the, you know, the drilling which for me is, the, is the, you know one of the primary methodologies is you know I learned Spanish as a beginner um in a in a class with it with a with very traditional teacher who actually taught my grandparents and my dad to speak wow. Spanish. So that's great, isn't it? Um, and and her method was absolutely just drill and repeat, transformational kind of drills. And at the beginning stages, particularly, you know, as, a, as an absolute beginner, it was really, really helpful really helpful mm. and it gave me a lot of confidence in saying very basic things in Spanish being able to have a very basic conversation and, and have certain you know functional exponents that were useful um, at my fingertips it was useful yeah. uh, interestingly I went back to see her as visiting with with my parents who were still going to her when they were much better they were sort of probably that time sort of like say I don't know b2 or something and um and at that point, she was still doing the same thing. And I, at that point, I kind of went, oh, not so. And at that point, I was a language teacher. And I was a lot more uh, critical, I suppose, of her approach at that point with right. that level and at that, you know, in that context. But I do remember as a sort of 16 year old, it being incredibly helpful and supportive. And, and it got me a lot further than my Spanish teacher in school did over a short period mm. of time. Yeah. So. So uh, I guess it's yeah. it's about choosing appropriate methodologies or, or you know, picking appropriate methodologies for particular context, isn't it? You know, if you. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me of um, uh, when we were looking for the book that I wrote, when we were looking into discovery learning as an approach, one of the things we found is like, you know, it's not necessarily a bad approach. Um, it's very popular and fashionable, but it, 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 it's very it's not very good for low level learners uh, because of the cognitive uh, demands it makes on them. So mm -hmm. actually with very high level learners, discovery learning could be uh, quite effective, but they have to have a, a, a so yeah, just to, just to reinforce what you're saying about um, yeah. different approaches for different levels. Yeah, absolutely. And you know and, and different contexts generally, I think, but you know I, I, I think it's, it's perhaps that whole thing of not not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and as you say, not setting it up as a straw man. You know, this was bad, and now we now we know better, and and now yeah. you know, that the future is is rosy because. <laughs> it's not. I mean, I think that is one of the things that one of the things I when when I did my MA was um, the first thought of going back in in historically. I mean, way back hundreds of years, and looking at methods and going. Hmm, they're actually quite similar in lots of ways yeah, to what yeah, we're doing now yeah. and just everything goes around and comes around and you know there's nothing really new under the sun it just gets repackaged and perhaps you know obviously there are things with technology and stuff that weren't possible in the past but but essentially learning a language has got certain 
things which need to be done and and yes I, I often wonder how I, th- I think you know knowledge does progress clearly but it's it's worth not viewing it as a now now we know sort of thing it's interesting how people keep rediscovering um the same thing you know, like Ebbinghaus had his kind of forgetting curve in the 1800s and then um Pimsler kind of rediscovered it in the 70s and I think now people are again rediscovering it and saying oh there's a kind of there's a well-researched what do you call it schedule to when human beings forget knowledge and if you if you review the knowledge (laughs) at that time it would be good I mean it's like yeah we've known that for 150 years why isn't it like day one of the Mm. CELTA for example (laughs) um yeah interesting you mentioned your book I think we you know we're probably sort of um, I'm aware of time um, but yeah. perhaps you could talk about the book that you've written because that sort of takes this but also other things doesn't it yeah so me Carol Lethaby and Patty Harris um, wrote a book called an introduction to evidence-based ELT in the language class a very long title um, which is just basically I guess for, for I mean, it's aimed at kind of Celta Delta courses and MA courses, but it's a kind of, it's a book about, it's a book with uh, information about research into teaching and education in general. And it has activities and things in there. So if you wanted to use it on a course, I think it would be uh, possibly quite useful. Um, It got nominated for uh, uh, Elton recently, didn't win, unfortunately, but it was nominated, which is good. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in the kind of looking at things, looking at education from a completely different perspective or a slightly different perspective than the kind of generally accepted view, then you might find it interesting. Uh, I think it's one of the few books that I've seen in, in EFL that has a large section on cognitive load theory, which sounds very like daunting but it's actually quite a straightforward uh, theory. It's just a, basically a theory of like how much information you can hold in your mind at any one time mm-hmm. and not overloading students with various things. It's very readable. It's written uh, at a student level. You might want to get a copy for your department or something. Great. I was sort of thinking that you've been, I was going to say banging on about, but that's not the majority. I have, I have been banging on about. <laughs> you, you've been... Uh, um, you know, attempting to enlighten the world for, for the last sort of 10 years or more. And and I wonder if you felt that um, there is more or less or the same or you know, whether anything's changed in that decade as to whether teachers are seeking more evidence based practices or whether they're more interested in that or whether things are, you know, the status quo is, is being maintained. That's a really good question. That's a great question and something I think about a lot. Um, I think what's happened is what I kind of feared was would happen. I wrote about this in 2014-ish, I think, um, on, a, on a blog post. And my fear was that things like learning styles or neurolinguistic programming would, would disappear, but that other things would rush in to replace them. Mm. Uh, and therefore the kind of the surface level issues, the surface level, the phenomena that kind of grow out of this mindset, mm-hmm. the surface level things would disappear, but then new things would, would grow to replace them because the underlying mindset has not changed. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of one of the issues. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of want teachers to be empowered. I, I don't want teachers to slavishly follow what researchers say I won't teach it because I don't I mean a lot of a lot of researchers pushed learning styles mm. they were wrong and they haven't retracted those papers but I think you need teachers who can say well I've, I've looked at this I've looked at the evidence and I, I don't think this is a good method or, or I'm going to use this instead and to be empowered but I think we're still in the kind of teachers are kind of like grass being blown about by uh, various winds it could be like a government policy or it could be fashion, quite often fashion, I think. So, you know, a good one is 21st century skills, which has come out of nowhere and is really, really popular. And again, you know, there might be some arguments you could make 
for teaching some of these things, but people need to, I think, make those arguments, not just say, oh, this is what we should be doing now. This is what we need to do now. I think the questioning mindset and saying, why should we be doing this in the classroom? What value does it have? Is it the best way to do what I want to do? Um, and so on and so forth. That's what's missing. But yeah, learning styles is gone, I think. I don't know. For I'd, most I'd like to believe you, but I still occasionally come across it in various sort of little pockets of things. And I think, wow. Well, anyway, it's yeah. been delightful to talk to you, Russ. And I, yeah. um, I'll put a link to, to your book down below and the and the paper obviously the papers exactly like paper it's behind paywalls but uh i've been you i think you kindly said that if anybody was interested in reading the original then you would be happy to email them a copy if they emailed you is that right sure yeah yeah email me and i'll, I'll send you a copy yeah That's, that would be great thank you thank you so much for talking to me it's been a delight and uh yeah. thanks for having me see you soon see you soon I'm here today with a really special guest. This is a bit of a different... Oh, no, hold on. Um, 